Well, great. It's awesome to be here. Let me do this very quickly. Um, this is the first book, and uh, Cindy did the forward for it. So this was the launching book for the Women on the Front Lines uh, gatherings. And uh, Michael Ann had studied the life of Joan of Arc. And so this one has then overviews from different women of courage. So Women on the Front Lines, A Call to Courage, and uh, uh, Perpetua, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Amy Simple McPherson, Lydia Prince, Bertha Smith, Corey Ten Boom, Jackie Pollinger. And I have all of these three books that are the Women on the Front Lines trilogy, and each of them then highlighted different women. And then this one, A Call to the Secret Place, highlights the life of Madame Jean Guion, and then other women of the secret place, and then led up to a chapter about Beth Alvis, and a chapter then about Gwen, uh, Gwen Shaw. And then this one was the final book, A Call to Compassion, A Call to Take Action, highlighted the life of Catherine Booth, and then brought us all the way up to a modern day heroine of the faith of compassion of Heidi Baker. And just so you know, we have discounted these books like $10 off, so they're out there on my table, so they're only for $6, okay? That's basically wholesale, okay? So there you go, there you go, somebody come and get them. <laughs> this is also uh, put on discount. This is a book that Benny Johnson has hosted from uh, Bethel. It's called Prayer Changes Things. And a little unknown guy named James Gall, Elmer Towns, Morris Cirillo, Mahesh Chavda, Peter Wagner. And this one is also on sale out there. And these are some of the newer. Uh, this is teaching you how to journal. Your revelatory personal journal exploring your dreams and visions. And so there you go. And then this is a new version of the seer. It's the seer expanded. I update, how many of you ever read The Seer? Okay, well this is a new version with a 40 day devotional journal that's been added and then I updated the storyline, here you go. Okay, would you stand please? I am um, doing something different, but that's not unusual. I'm going to read one verse, and we're going to do a potpourri. And my verse that I'm giving you for this session, I'm calling this message Treasures New and Old. And Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. To me, it's fascinating, the order. Please remain standing for just a little bit, if you would. These are the words of Jesus, the head of a household, a disciple of the kingdom of heaven, a wise man, a wise woman. We each have treasure chest. And we build up treasures out of our relationship with this glorious God and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And the person of the Holy Spirit and God our Father. But one of the things that's fascinating to me is that it says, they bring out treasures. You don't just store them up. You bring them out. You bring out treasures new and old. So one of the keys is honoring all that has gone before us in Jewish and in church history. And then reaching forward in progressive revelation in the now voice of God. 
Man does not live, but by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, the ever proceeding word. So a wise man, a disciple of the kingdom of heaven, honors the past and even has their own treasures of that is considered old. But a wise servant continues in a fresh relationship where things are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. I want you to remain standing for a moment. This is my bringing forth treasures new and old. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified? My Lord, were you there when they nailed him to that tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Sometimes he 
causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when he rose up from the dead? Let's give a shout to the resurrected Jesus! You can be seated. tell you some stories I'm going to release some declarations and I'm going to sing <laughs> at one of the women on the front lines conferences a couple of years ago perhaps I gave a message on finding hope rediscovering life after tragedy and a part of my journey in all of our journeys, I've been trying to find my roots. And I've been trying to discover that which brings life to me. And before I was ever a preacher, before I was ever an intercessor, before I was ever an intergalactical prophet, <laughs> before I was ever a champion for women, I sang the songs of Zion. So my first declaration is this. The door of the harvest is open. Of course, in the book of Joel, it says, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. And we know from Matthew 9, 38, and from Luke 10, 2, that Jesus is the one who teaches his disciples how to pray. And he says, and he teaches them to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might send forth laborers into the field. So let me tell you a story about one of the main mentors in my life in prayer. Dear Bob Jones, graduated to Jesus a few days ago on Valentine's Day. He was my papa. He was the one I learned the most what to do and what not to do. <laughs> Love you, Bobby Joe Jones. That he had a vision one day. He calls me on the phone when I lived in Kansas City. He says, well, I saw a man. He told me how tall he was, what he looked like. He said he was a swimmer when he was college. He said, I knew the man, but he didn't. And here's what he said about him. He said, this man considers himself a private in God's army, but God says he's a general. 
This man has been wounded often by the body of Christ, but he forgives daily. And then he said this, I'll never forget it. He said, God always delights to hear this man's prayers. And he said, you've met him. I do not know who he is. Who is he? And I had just returned from helping Mahesh Chavda lead a trip and I did the intercessory and a daytime and we had round the clock prayer and I met an, a gentleman named Dick Simmons and he became one of my primary men in my life that has put an imprint of prayer and intercession. So I'm going to tell you an early Dick Simmons story. He was a young man. He was praying at 2 a.m. in the morning on the bank of the Hudson River outside of New York City. And in the middle of the night, he starts reminding God of his word. And I know his very voice inflections because then many years later, I with a few others prayed hundreds of hours with him in New York City. And at 2 a.m. in the morning, Dick, long ways away, was heard praying, I pray to the Lord of the harvest. Dick used to teach me to pray from my diaphragm. I thought you only sang from your diaphragm. I pray to the Lord of the harvest that he sends forth laborers into the field. Lights came flashing at 2 a.m. in the morning. Sirens blared. Police came and they said to Dick Simmons, what are you doing? And he said, I'm praying to the Lord of the harvest that he sends laborers into the field. The reason the police came was because some distance away, at 2 a.m. in the morning, his prayers woke people up. And they reported him for disturbing the peace. The police didn't know what to do with him. Let him kept on praying. And that was the night the Holy Spirit fell on a little skinny preacher in Pennsylvania named David Wilkerson. And that was when he got his call to go to New York City and start Team Challenge that became World Challenge and then later on his second assignment, Times Square Church. I have a word to tell to you right now. Every day is the day of salvation. But there are times and seasons in God. Times we plant seeds. Times we water. Times that it grows. And then it's harvest time. I am not saying this is the great final harvest. But I am declaring this. The door of the harvest is open. I want you to put your hand on your heart right now and lift up your loved ones. We agree right now that the Lord of the harvest sends laborers across the field of our loved ones. And we send forth your word and we declare it will not return void but it shall accomplish the purpose for which this prayer and the declaration of these words are being sent forth, whether through God TV or through any medium in every manner, because prayer has no distance. Let me give you another recent story. I like stories. I was ministering in Jakarta, Indonesia in June with some dear friends. It was a rather large conference, several thousands of people. And I had police escort. I had a trained professional bodyguard 
and an armor bearer and an entourage. I was there with Che On and Heidi Baker and Bill Johnson. It was such a delight to be there. My bodyguard was a Muslim and he had never ever been in a church service in his life, let alone a flag waving, river flowing, prophetic, apostolic, Shaba, Shaba, Shaba gathering. So I'm up there releasing declarations and the Holy Spirit is manifesting. And he'd never been in anything like this. But while I'm releasing Holy Spirit declarations, he has a visitation. Five angels appeared to him. The next morning, he doesn't know protocol because it's only going to be his second Christian service he's ever been in. And you understand Muslims actually believe in prophets. So there's a principle. If you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet that's in the Bible, you'll receive a prophet's reward. And he was serving me. So he goes up and he takes the microphone. He don't know no better. He takes the microphone. They're translating it for me into English. And he says, while prophet James Gall, and I don't even call myself a prophet, but it's fine if other people call you that because if they eat the fruit, and you know, yeah, if that's, if, you know, if you're an evangelist, eat the evangelist fruit, call you an evangelist. So he, he said, while I'm serving prophet James Gall, he gets up and he says, I'm a Muslim. And he said, while I was serving prophet James Gall, I had a visitation of five angels. And everybody starts applauding. It was interesting. And I'm going, oh, fascinating. Now I'm arguing with God. Because I'm going, okay, what's my message? And the Holy Spirit says to me, I want you to preach on why I pray a take and stand for Israel. And I'm going, wait a second. Largest populated Muslim country in the world. Wrong guy. Wrong message. Wrong place. Wrong time. So I go back to God. What's my message for today? Why I pray and take a stand for Israel. Hey, wrong place, wrong time, wrong guy, wrong message. Do you want to listen and obey? So I get up there. Ha! Ah. And while I am preaching, why I pray and take a stand for Israel, my straight lace professional Muslim bodyguard, while I'm doing a message on Israel, has another visitation. And I have never had this one. I go, not fair, not fair, not fair. Because while I'm preaching on Israel, Jesus appears to this Muslim bodyguard. Not only Jesus, but get this, Jesus with his 12 disciples show up. And Jesus, while I'm preaching on Israel, Jesus with his 12 disciples look at him and say, would you be one of my disciples? He gave his life to the Lord. My book, Deliverance from Darkness, had just been translated in Indonesian. He got a copy of it. My armor bearer ended up helping him. I know from the report that he's been water baptized is now a member of a church. I am declaring this. The door of the harvest is open. The door The door of the harvest is open. Number two declaration. It's time once again for the hour of prayer. 
Isaiah 62, 6 and 7. I have appointed watchmen on the walls who will give themselves no rest to give him no rest until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And it's true. It is true. It is the only city in the, this entire book that all people of all times are called to pray for by name. Matthew 26, 40 is very interesting because this is when Jesus speaks to some of his disciples and he says, could you not tarry with me an hour? We've had many different prayer movements. It's probably all been one great prayer movement with many different phases. Starting in around the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, I don't believe it has culminated yet. I don't believe it has peaked yet. But there are three great streams, three great, in a way, tributaries to this prayer stream and worship stream. The prayers of the local church. The networks of prayer, provincially, state-wise, nationally and international and the houses of prayer and we must see these three tributaries of the one great stream brought together in this hour so I declare into the global prayer movement a no competition zone we are moving into the season of some of the greatest divine cooperation where prayer is wedded with missions. I grew up in a Methodist church. I grew up at the age of three, singing. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my father's throne make all my one and we is known in seasons of distress and grief my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return sweet hour of Lay, share, 
Till from Mount Pisgah's lofty height I'll view my home and take my flight This robe of flesh I'll drop oh, to seize the everlasting price and shout while passing through the Sweet hour, oh, sweet hour. Prayer is not a treachery. Prayer is a delight. I remember when I was in college and I'd grown my hair out long. <laughs> I had bell bottoms and I sewed on braid because I tried to be a Jesus freak. <laughs> and I got full of the Holy Ghost. And my little black and white TV set turned into Omnivision overnight. And I started having visions, and I didn't know what a vision was. And I prophesied before I ever spoke in tongues. And I didn't even know what prophecy was. And the first prophecy I ever heard was out of my own mouth. And it went something like this. In 1972, as it was in the last week of the earthly ministry of Jesus, he came to his father's house and the zeal of the Lord of hosts consumed him. I didn't even know what prophecy was. It just bubbled up and gushed out and came out. And he declared, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. And so shall it be in the last week of his earthly ministry by the Spirit in the last days. He shall come again to visit his father's house. He will turn over the money changing tables. He will go to the cage where the ceremonial dove is there and he will open it up and set the dove of God free. Praise will break out amongst the children because in that day, bread will be, the healing will be the children's bread. And he will come in those days in the last week of his ministry by the Spirit in the last days and zeal shall consume him once again and he will declare in that hour to that people in that generation my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. That was the first prophecy I ever heard. It's one of the only ones I remember. Because that one got in me. I remember the day my kids came to me. This was a glorious day. He said, Dad! We think we kind of understand you a little better now. <laughs> That's probably not the easiest task. 
I remember this so clear. And they said to me, your greatest ministry is not before me. Your greatest ministry is before God. A.J. Gordon said it something like this. You can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you can't do more than pray until you've prayed. I declare to you the three streams, the three tributaries of this prayer and worship stream are coming together, and I declare a no competition zone in Jesus' name. Number three, I'll try to do this one quicker. It's upgrade time. It's upgrade in the prophetic. The night that our dear Papa Bob Jones, seer prophet, went to be with the Lord, one of our dear prophetic friends had a very clear dream. And in this dream, Bob Jones says in a dream, no, I didn't say Bob Jones literally said this. This was a dream, okay? But in the dream, Bob Jones says that he had to graduate so that, now this is me now putting my words to this, but that a vacuum could be created so that the rest of us could come up higher because it was upgrade time. About six weeks ago, the voice of the Holy Spirit came to me, not in my heart. Now he comes there. But on a rare occasion, the external audible voice of the Lord comes to me. And it almost, ha almost happens in my bedroom. And he came to me recently, about six weeks ago, and he said this. The external audible voice of the Lord. The seed sown by the seers and the prophets into a younger generation decades ago have now come into fruition. Therefore, a detailed word of knowledge will be released again, creating an atmosphere of the fear of the Lord, awe and wonder. I want you to declare it's upgrade time. I want you to declare to him it's upgrade time. I want you to declare to him it's upgrade time. I want you to say right here, right now, I receive a prophetic upgrade of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, of the anointing of the Holy Spirit of signs and wonders for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. That's three declarations. Do you like this? Let me give you a fourth declaration. We have crossed a threshold into a time of fire. It is the time of fire. Matthew 3, 1 it is a declaration about John the Baptist, but then of Yeshua, that there was one who was coming who would come with the baptism of spirit and fire. Acts 2, verses 2 to 4, on the day of Pentecost, when it had fully come, there was tongues of fire that set on their head. There was the feeling of that resulted in, as it were, new wine, and there was the sound of a mighty rushing wind. I'm not here just to tell Bob Jones stories, but it is good to note that this seer prophet, amongst uh, some others, that often in the Hebrew calendar, in the 10 days of all, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, etc., 
sometimes receives words then that's for the coming year or, or thereafter. And one of the things that Bob was shown on his last day of atonement on this side, he was given an egg. The egg opened up and inside the egg was a flame of fire. That's his last word on the Day of Atonement. In the early years, Bob prophesied three movements that would happen. I'm not saying they're the only, and there's only three, but they are the, what he saw. The first, there would be a movement of new wine, and then the movement of new wine then would be followed by a movement of fire, and then the movement of fire then would be followed by a movement of the sound of a mighty rushing wind of the wind. For 20 years, we have celebrated the Father's blessing that has gone around the world from out of a little barn in Toronto. That I am declaring along with many others, we are crossing a threshold because it's time for fire. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 9 to 13. That's one of my life passages that I wrote my first book, The Lost Art of Intercession, based out of. That the fire shall be kept burning continually on the altar. It'll never go out. That the fire shall be kept burning continually on the altar, and it will never go out. That the fire will be kept burning continually on the altar and it will never go out put your hand on your heart again because this is we are the temple of the living god and this is the place where there is supposed to be fresh fire and so we kindle into a flame the very fire of god and we declare that fire burns out dross and bring sanctification. So we declare as Carol Arnott did at their 20th anniversary in Toronto that there is now a new movement of the Holy Spirit. It's a movement of holiness. A movement of holiness and the fire of God. So I release it and I declare it over the airwaves. It's time for the real fire. Not wild fire, not strange fire, real fire, holy fire. We declare it's time for holy fire. And let our hearts have a road to Emmaus experience that through the word, through the word, through the word, God will open his word to us and we will be like those disciples and we will say, were our hearts burning, burning warmly within as he opened the word to us. The door of the harvest is open. It's time for the hour of prayer. Three it's an upgrade in the prophetic for it's a time of fire, number five. I believe that we're crossing a threshold. I'm going to say specifically in the prophetic movement into what I am now terming redemptive interpreters. Redemptive interpretation. It doesn't necessarily take a prophet to say the problems are present. But there are a certain level of prophets or people that all they do is declare the problem. I am reaching. I see the problems, believe me. I'm not an ostrich with my head in the ground. By the way, back on the hour of prayer, I just moved into a new house in July. And I knew when I moved into that new place that visitations were going to start all over again for me, and they have. And the first night in my new house, 
a warrior angel came at the end of my bed and woke me up. <laughs> and I do believe my heart is getting reawakened. But then a warrior angel, I hadn't seen this angel for 26 years, stood at the end of my bed and dressed in a military uniform and all it said was this, attention, be on the alert. And the sound of that went into my being and I didn't sleep rest of the night. <laughs> so I have a word, attention, be on the alert. I like to unpack that one a whole lot more, but I got to move on. It's a time for redemptive interpreters, solution prophets, not just problem prophets. In every place, I've been, Detroit's been put on my heart in this, these last few months. And I've been doing ministry back in Michigan and in Detroit. And, and the first night that I was there a few months recently, the Holy Spirit gives me a dream and he says, every place there's devastation, there'll be transformation. That takes redemptive interpretation. Where you see the darkness. We do not deny the darkness that Isaiah 60 says. There will be a darkness that will cover the earth, a gross and a deep darkness, even the people. But in that very hour, when it is the darkest, it is the hour when the light shall shine the brightest. Arise, shine, for my glory will be risen upon you. And even kings, 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 kings shall come to the brightness of that shining. In every place that there's devastation, there'll be transformation. And I'm trying in here with all that I know, I'm trying to shift myself. I want to be <laughs> I want to be a hope ambassador. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. On oh, Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Oh, Christ the solid, Rock I stand, all other ground is sinking. 
walking sand all other ground is sinking sand my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and his righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but a holy trust in Jesus name on oh, Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground All other ground is sinking sand. I declare it is time for redemptive interpreters to come forth. I say it is time for misery Christianity to end. And it's time for us to be clothed in the full armor of God and we will put back on the helmet of salvation and we will put back on the helmet of hope the positive expectation of good Vine's expository dictionary of Greek words for hope says it's the happy anticipation of good. Something good is just about to happen. Redemptive interpreters. Now you understand, I'd like to take about three hours to unpack every one of these. Good. Number six. Here's my eschatology. The glory and the shaking come together. Haggai 2, verses 2 to 9. We don't have time to go to there to read it all. But the latter glory of the house will be greater than the former. It was about the natural, the first temple. And they were so fascinated about its external glory. Even the queen of Sheba came to observe it. And people were in awe and wonder of its stature and its beauty. It was destroyed and a second temple was built and a remnant of people remained and, and they're like, oh, I just don't know if this is the same. And it's a parallel of restoration about the body of Christ. I tell you, the latter glory of the house will be greater. Number seven, my last point. This is one of the strongest words that is within me for 2014 and beyond. Joanne. It's the word restore. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19 to 21, this is apostolic teaching. It says repent. That's apostolic teaching. It says repent and return. That times in the plural, times of refreshing will come from somewhere called the presence of God from the presence of God repent and return the times of refreshing they come from the presence of God and that Jesus will be restrained or retained in heaven until the fullness of the period of restoration of all things spoken by the holy prophets of old Haggai 2 and Acts 3 kind of frame up the simplicity of my eschatology today. 
Jesus is held in heaven until the restoration of all things spoken by the holy prophets of old. So we're in a restoration pattern. The restoration of the message, the restoration of the messengers, the restoration of the methodology. Here are seven things that I know that are being restored. Israel to her land that God appointed for the Jewish people. Number two, the fire burning continually on the altar, the worship and prayer movement. Three, the restoration of a supernatural culture where all things are possible. Number four, the restoration of compassion where we learn to stop for the one. Number five, the synergy of the generations. The wisdom of the older, the resources of the middle, and that unfeigned zeal of the young. <laughs> Brought together in a generation for a sustained move of holy God. That's number five. Number six, the kingdom mandate. And that's why today there is the favor of the Lord resting on teachings like the seven cultural mountains and things of this nature. Because we are called to be kingdom shapers. We are called to invade every facet of life with the light and the glory of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And number seven, the restoration of the message, the messengers and the method, Israel, the fire on the altar, the culture of the supernatural, the ministry of compassion, the synergy of the generations, the kingdom mandate and the church's commission, the harvest and true discipleship. That might sound simple, but it is not. As these things are all restored, it's going to create one of the greatest, greatest awakenings that planet Earth has ever seen. It's going to create, it's going to create, it's going to create one of the greatest awakenings that planet Earth has ever seen. Because the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters covers the seas. And you say, well, how can this happen? Many years ago, teaching classes in Nashville, Tennessee, I got off on one of these rant and raving things like this. And in front of my class, I asked, how can this be? And the Holy Spirit responded and he said, one clay pot at a time. <laughs> he's going to put his glory in you and 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 his glory in the God TV crew. And his glory in you and his glory in you and his glory in me. And then we just going to leak it out. <laughs> But treasures new and old. How does any of this happen? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. How does this, how will this, these things, and we all see in part, know in part, and prophesy in part, how will any of this come about? because of his amazing grace.
treasures new and old. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a rich life. still one of these seats but I declare this has gone forth and it will not return void because the best the best the best cause the best cause the best The 
Yeah.